Okay, so it's 7 p.m. and we'll go ahead and get started. Some of you may have heard that um, the recording is in progress. So if anybody is wanting to watch this later on, we'll be able to do that as well. Um, but I'm excited to introduce everybody to our fifth annual Read Architectural Lecture. Um, we didn't have it last year, but we're back. It's a little bit of a different format, but it's good to have it anyway. Uh, tonight, we're going to be with uh, John Reed, and I have a short bio to introduce him, and then I'll hand it over to him uh, to start the lecture off for tonight. Um, so John Reed leads the design studio of Canon Design in New York City. He has a wide and varied experience in both the practice and teachings of architecture. Before, before establishing his own firm, he served in a partnership positions with Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners and with Cotter Kim and Associates in both Boston and London and practiced with numerous architectural firms, including Richard Meyer and Partners, Gwathme Siegel, Cohn Peterson and Fox. He has received many awards with each professional association. Academic experience includes appointments at Harvard University, Syracuse University, and New York Institute of Technology, in addition to lecturing and serving on frequent design theories across the country. Mr. Reed received a Master's of Architecture from Harvard University, a Bachelor of Architectural uh, Architecture from Cornell University, and is a registered architect in the state of New York. A member of the American Institution of Architects, he lives in Katona, New York, with his wife, Alicia K. Sandberg Esquire, and their two sons, Mill and Sawyer. And he is joining us virtually. I don't, I believe Maureen let me know you're not even in New York, so it may be uh, somewhere different, but we can come together for the Cumberland County Historical Society tonight. And thank you so much for joining us tonight and giving us another great lecture. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a real honor to uh, be the fifth in this series. And I'd like to thank my mother for, for hosting this and having the idea to have a lecture series in architecture in Carlisle. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of, of different projects. And I want to place the, the work within a sphere of this idea that architecture is about ideas. This is a phrase I heard in my first day of architecture school with uh, 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 the chairman of the architecture department standing in front of all of us cowering freshmen, you know, saying things like, look to your right, look to your left. Neither one of them are going to be there in five years. And then he proceeded to start this amazing slideshow where he started talking about what architecture was really about. And I was a pretty cocky kid. You know, my father was an architect, my grandfather. I thought I already knew what architecture was about. And uh, he began showing all these things that I'd never seen. And it was a really amazing, eye-opening experience. So I want to talk about um, really, let's see if my slides will advance here. One moment, please. Hmm. Here we go. I'm going to talk about four distinct sets of, of ideas. And um, really, these came out of a series of lectures that I've been giving during the year during the, the pandemic to uh, bring up discussion among folks in my office and, and sort of the younger people. So the first, the first concept is the grid, the second is the section, the third topic is detail and materiality, and the last one is really process. Investigate, ask, draw, tell, build. The grid is really the basis of all of the uh, plan and, and sort of ideas of how architecture is organized. It supports the floors, it supports the roof, it spatially supports the architectural ideas that layer the building. And these sets of images come out of a book that was published in 1976. So I studied architecture school in 1980, and Colin Rowe was a professor there. And these ideas really formed the, the beginnings of my education. The idea that architecture could be taught by studying specific precedents, that they could be analyzed, and that they could be understood and replicated in your own sort of student projects. So on this page, you see two different uh, uh, buildings, two different projects. Uh, the first one on the top is by uh, Andrea Palladio in 1560. It's called Villa Malcatenta. It's a really interesting uh, villa, sits on the side of a river. The distinguishing characteristics are that the front and the back are really, really different. And then if you look at the plan um, to the left of those two elevations, you see that there are, there are divisions in the plan. There are zones. And if you look at the plan down below it, very, very different plan, a freeform plan by Le Corbusier, uh, a Villa Garche, we always called it in school. The same structure is supporting those uh, different walls and, and stair locations. The structural grid on the left is very similar. 
There's even a proportioning system when you look at the outside. The box that's drawn around those elevations is called a golden set. It was thought to be the perfect form for you know, all kinds of architectural ideas. You'll see it um, uh, facades of, of Greek temples and different buildings analyzed using this proportioning system. But it's, it was fascinating to me that these two buildings separated by 400 years have the same sets of principles underlying their design. Um, there were also ways of looking at our buildings, looking at architecture, excuse me, that, that broke it down into different ways of, of, of drawing. And these are exonometrics. Uh, this is an architect named Peter Eisenman, and the drawings on the left are him analyzing a building by Giuseppe, Giuseppe Tarani. And he's pulling apart the, the, the volumes of the facade, the layers of the, of the different plan elements, and then explaining how these things come together to organize the building. He used that same technique in his own architecture. So this is one of his houses of, uh, of house number six of 1975. Um, so I decided just to show you a, a sort of a, a series of, of other ways of, of, or other types of, of buildings that are analyzed in the same way. You know, the drawing on the top is, is a pavilion by uh, Mies van der Rohe. We actually visited this, my mother and my family, a few years ago. And you can see that there are a series of overlapping spaces. Those rectangles are, are you know, either defined by walls or roofs or pool edges or, or planes on the ground. The building down below, there's the Roby House. It has a similar set of organizing zones that hold together those spaces. You can also look at it as a structural grid and you can see how the grids align across and they're very, very similar. So I thought it might be interesting to take the same set of, of, of ways of looking at architecture and look at a, a project that, that we had done in the office. Um, this is a building at Carnegie Mellon's campus in Pittsburgh. It's an interesting campus uh, composed of, of um, really the work of two, two major architects. The first one was Henry Hornbossel up in the upper left-hand corner. He did the buildings in the green. They're really a, a beautiful combination of Beaux-Arts architecture and, and sort of gritty industrial uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, buildings. And then they're all sort of tied together with uh, amazing brickwork. You can see the, the detail of the brickwork in the picture below Henry's picture. The photograph on the top right in this group, the, the Campietto at the top is actually the smokestack for the central heating plant of the, of the campus. And that sits right here. Um, in 1980, Michael Dennis won a competition to do this university center. I was part of a team that also competed for it. We got second place. Michael won the, the project, got to do the Performing Arts Center across the cut, as he called it, the squad, did the, um, the bleachers and the lockers and the new football field and then two dorms around it. He didn't quite get to complete his quad. The, the, the university's president sat in this building and they didn't want to block the view into the quad. So we, when we arrived at the scene, it was a, 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 an assignment to make an addition onto Michael Dennis's building. So this is my revenge project. I, I say that jokingly, Michael was a, was a great teacher. I had him a number of times and a good friend. In fact, when we won the project, I went to his office to show him what we had shown in the interview. And then later on, when it was under construction, I sat with him for two hours while he grilled me about the architecture. He quipped, um, you know, John, it's not exactly what I would have done, but I'm really glad that you did it. And I'm not quite sure if that's good or bad, but the idea here was to make an addition to a, a, a very interesting mixed use building. Um, it contains all kinds of social spaces, you know, commons. It has performing arts spaces, lecture halls. It has all of the student services for clubs, number of different dining spaces located in, in, in nooks and crannies of the building. And then all of the athletics for the campus right here in the back, of the gym, courts for squash, uh, and, a, and a huge um, swimming pool area. So we're making an addition that includes a new black box theater, a new north lobby because the campus is expanding down the hill and they want to have an entrance from this side and then some new fitness space on this, on this end. The first thing that we did is we looked at the structural grid of Michael Dennis's colonnade and it's on an 18 foot center to center. And we took that as the organizing system for our new structural uh, system in our, our building. This is the second floor plan. We took that same system and we shifted it by one module because we wanted to do some things spatially inside the building. So whenever you see this little eye with a, with a little cone on it, the next drawing I'm gonna show you is gonna be a, a photograph or a picture looking at that view. And then you're gonna see where these red and blue lines occur in the architecture. 
But you can see on the outside of the building, the red are the structural grid of the building, the blue is the, is the shift, and that becomes these fins that shade the facade. And there's actually another shift on the lower level that is where a series of, of uh, mirrors are integrated into the um, lower portions of the gym. So the, the planner moves become the facade moves and the organization of the facade is, is determined by the plan. Um, the same thing happens on the inside. So here we are standing inside the gymnasium or fitness space, looking towards the front, looking towards that same elevation I just showed you. The red planes that are moving toward you are the structural bays, and the blue is where the fin is located on the facade, and it's also becoming the, the demarcation of how we shape the skylight above. So these, these lines and these forms and these, um, these zones are moving through the architecture. This is another way of looking at the building, the overlaps of the, of the major circulation pieces and the major volumes. We extend those zones from his building into our building. So it's becoming the place where there's a hole in the, in the fitness space. It's organizing the shape and the dimension of the service bar. This was previously the, the loading dock of the building right here. So we're making a new uh, loading zone back here. It moves this way across the plan. We call these the hammerheads at either end of, of Michael Johnson's loggia. So it moves through our building, organizing the service spaces. And then we've added more zones that are moving through the space. And you'll see that in the next set of diagrams. So this is our grid slash alignment diagram. And now we're going to look at that center bay on the outside of the building. So you can see that it's all organized like a skewer around the center of the, of the um, performing arts space and the, and the lobby space. And you can see that those two hallways make their their appearance on the outside of the building becoming a zone in the edge of the, of the fitness space, and then transforming and, and sort of flexing in, in interesting ways to become this new three-dimensional entrance canopy over the front door of the building. Looking at it from the, from the backside, I mean, I sort of call this the back, this is really looking at it from the parking garage where a lot of people would be entering it. I want you to note the purple zone moving through the middle of this, which is making a sort of an inflection uh, in the hole that's in the center of the fitness space. It's determining the location of a window that's on this north courtyard, and it's determining the exact shape of the, of the fin that shelters the, the entrance canopy. So you see that on the outside. And in fact, when you look through here, you can see the sort of cross hatching of all those other grids that I showed you from the front of the building, moving through that middle zone where that hole was and the different skylights that are letting light in. There's also an inflection on this corner where we wanted to have a view out over the football field. We thought that would be a really great um, thing to have in the gym space and, a, and sort of an overlook. And then we were also, you know, making sure that people weren't really looking down into the loading dock zone. So now we're going to move inside and through this, this uh, space in this direction. So let's see the next picture. So here we're standing in that, in that uh, fitness space. I'm going to back up one more. You'll notice that the, that the hole has these two lines going through it that is making its way to the window and the window at this end. And there's a jog in the, in the, in the outline of this, of this hole that's cut into the floor. So you can see it within the, the, the way that the handrails have been shifted. And you can see it where the window aligns in the end. And you can see it how the skylights align with that as well. So that's that, 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 that zone moving through in that direction. We're gonna move back out now into the courtyard. And you can see that same purple zone that we were just looking at on the inside forming this window. Michael Dennis's buildings has all these beautiful bay windows. And we thought to make our own versions of his bay windows in maybe a more contemporary fashion. But that purple zone is flying across the open space in front of the, the big window that goes into the new North lobby and determining the width of the canopy and the, and the proportions of the entry there. And then when you move back onto the cut, onto the quad, and you look at Michael Dennis's uh, hammerhead, you can see that those same sets of proportions, the width of that hammerhead is determining the width of the pier that supports our entrance. So there are, there are proportions that we're working with that make this really contemporary addition fit with a much more um, postmodern or historic uh, derived uh, building. And then when we move into that center um, New North lobby, you can see it again. So you can see the elevator is these, these between these two purple lines. I'll back up one more. It's sort of hard to see here, but this is the elevator. I'll move forward again. And then you can see the blue line of the, of the, of the first plane, which is determining the balcony. 
the blue line of the second structural plane, which is forming the, the, the space, the, the zone of the center where the Chihuly sculpture is hung. And then lastly, the enclosure on the outside and the back wall, which are the two red zones. So all of those things create the, 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 the beauty of the architecture. And then lastly, and I spoke about this the last time I spoke with you guys in Carlisle, the, this whole sort of set of, of very um, prescriptive uh, ways of dividing up the space is sort of held together by an architectural narrative. The idea that where the building touches the Michael Dennis building, it's a much more historic, you know, traditional vocabulary with punch windows and it as it wraps, it gets more contemporary when it reaches the front door. So all of that is sort of wrapped around this, uh, this story that holds the building together, this narrative. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the section. And so in this case, I'm gonna show you a few precedents that are really, you know, like the precedents for section. So uh, this is the Laurentian Library by Michelangelo. Um, it's, it's this amazingly uh, plastic uh, space where the columns in the wall are embedded in the wall. There are little rubber band like moldings that wrap around it. The real chore here is just to make a stair to get up to an upper level, which is a reading room. And Michelangelo turns the stair into this glowing piece of lava-like geometry that fills the whole, whole room. And then he defines the edges of the, build, of the space with all of these, I mean, you could, you could analyze this in the same way that I just did the, the, the Cohen Center. You know, there are these sort of uh, piers that are defining the center of the space. And you know you enter in this zone at the at the far bay, um, so it's a it's a sort of a masterpiece of spatial definition. And of course, there are there are clear story windows that fill it with daylight. So you can't really understand the space until you have this this beautiful daylight that, that goes down into it. Another way of looking at sectional space is is Boromini's uh, method, where he completely turned it into a, a plastic. Um, I mean, today's example it might be might be Frank Gehry, where all of the the volumes are are conceived as you know ovals and round shapes, and there's no more straight orthogonal geometry. But it's a complete understanding of of um, of soft and plastic space. And then back to Le Corbusier, this is a this is a very talismanic uh, section, the one on the left. It's called uh, Villa Carthage, and it has these two overlapping C-shaped spaces where you can be in one space and overlooking a second space and overlooking a third space. So this overlap of, of this is actually two different apartments of spaces uh, in a modern way, all contained in a, in a very simple vocabulary. Uh, is something else that is, that is things that we think about all the time when we're working on our projects. Lastly, um, Lewis Kahn, I think that maybe some of you have visited this. This was the, the first building that I ever visited that made an emotional impact on me. And I think it's because of the quality of the, of the space, the quality of the light. But again, you know, it's a very simple set of gridded uh, columnar spaces where the infill is done with such care and the, and the openings are carved away. I mean, in this view, which is the entry, which is on this level right here, you're below the level of the gallery. So he infills the structural frame with this um, uh, slate at the bottom so that you're aware that you're in the, in the base of the building and you can see directly from the, from the lobby that you know, the, the next three floors above are where all of the, the library spaces are. This is the end of the sequence after you've come into the library where you've, you've climbed up and there's this round stair sitting at the back of the space that you wrap around to see the final set of old master paintings in it. And of course, it's all bathed in beautiful, uh, with beautiful skylights. So I'm gonna talk about something, it's a real shame to follow up Lou Khan with this, but I'm gonna talk about a project that, uh, that actually I'm photographing today down in Baltimore. And it's a big science building. It's 320,000 square feet. It's a $180 million science building. Um, the idea of this sectional space is that it's a pathway. When I gave this little talk earlier in the year in my office, I showed a number of different sectional spaces. Some of them were like catcher's mitts. Some of them were like were, were, were vertical spaces that were meant to connect things over multiple, multiple floors. And uh, this project was used to talk about the pathway. So the way the building is situated, you can see in this earlier rendering, is that there is a historic Stevens Hall on the main quad of the campus at an upper level. There happens to be a math building down at this end. There is a, a glen on this side and then a, a new uh, set of exterior sort of quad spaces on the front of it. 
And what we're doing is making the transition from that upper level to that lower level. The lab spaces are organized into these two bars. The, the teachers have, have offices on the ends. And then there's a series of honorific spaces that hover over that sequence as you move down through the space. Um, again, to talk about maybe precedents or things that are in the back of the mind of the designer as we're thinking about this. You know, I had visited Paris a long time ago and these steps leading up to Montmartre were amazing the way that they fell away beneath you as the, as the sort of city slid by. I'd seen a, a, a building in, in South Korea that was a woman's uh, university that is actually carved out of the earth with a similar set of big steps and worked on a few projects that were using similar techniques to organize the space. The drawing with the two bars is a, is a plan diagram of the building to show its relationship to the buildings around it. All of these things have to be thought of in relationship to the context around it. And in this case, we're, we're really trying to make a building that's sitting down in the earth, is not taking away any, any you know, grandeur from the, from the original building, and that is sort of organized geometrically to, to mediate that. So it starts in a narrower space and extends to a wider space. This section is cut from this side to this side. So you can see there's a series of cascading stairs, there are a number of sectional spaces that let you into uh, different parts of the building. The lower levels contain about 30 classrooms. A thousand students go into them at nine o'clock in the morning. The upper parts of the building have another two to three thousand students in different labs and different classroom spaces. So it's really an organizational machine to get students in and out. And then lastly, there's a room in the middle that's supposed to be the heart of the complex, the place where everybody can hang out, see their friends. The drawing on the top right is another analytic drawing showing the relationship of those stairs as they cascade down, and then the, the, the wall or the, the curved wall that defines that space. Um, interestingly enough, the project started with a, a partee that was very, very different, where the two bars were placed, you know, in, in, in completely perpendicular to the original, to the eventual uh, arrangement. And we couldn't make the scheme work. This was something the campus architect really wanted us to try to do. But the, the idea of the space is that it organizes the interior and when you're approaching it from this side, it didn't work as well. So these drawings were done midway through the schematic design to, to illustrate how the thing might sit in its, in its place, how the, the massing may be, may be determined and carved and its relationship to the historic building up the hill. Um, I'm showing these sort of sketchy drawings because you know, it's, it's not all just sort of uh, computer animation and computer renderings, but we still do draw a lot. And these drawings um, convey a sense of the designer's you know, mind, the designer's eye. This is standing up at the top and imagining what it might be like to cascade down through those spaces, looking to the left into some of those floating uh, classroom spaces. And this is at the bottom when you've reached the end of it. You'll see there's a hole actually cut in the floor here that never made it into the final design. And the spiral stair got, uh, didn't quite make it as well. There's only a portion of that. But um, the space is very similar. So I'm just gonna show you a couple renderings of it. This is a view taken from the front door. You've just come in. Right below you on the right here is a, um, um, a planetarium down below where high school kids and elementary school kids come and uh, great shows. You can go down that stair, down into the classrooms, or you can continue across where you get into this bigger room it is the, the heart of the space. And you, there's a, a wall at the end where they have performances. There are all kinds of places for the students to plug in and study. And this is what it looks like when you're looking up at it and you're seeing those, those sets of curved stairs move uh, through the space. So it's a really dynamic sectional space. Um, something that, that I think is surprising when you look at the outside, there's definitely a, a sense of surprise. And that's something that, that we wanted to have happen when you, when you come into this building. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about detail and materiality. Um, materials are really just, just the stuff we make the buildings out of. And there, there's a lot of different ways to treat the materials. You know, it can be anything from sort of wood to slate shingles to stone and, and precast concrete. Brick is an amazing uh, material to, to work with, to you know, cast it into different places and to, and to you know, work with it three-dimensionally. There is metal, there are ways of punching metal, there's glass, there's colored glass, there's terracotta. So there's, there's all kinds of things that we have in our, our um, palette nowadays as, as a modern you know, architect. And the question is for us, 
how do you put them together? And so I always tell people that, that architectural details is really the art of architecture. It's how you, and this is a building here in your, in your town here in Carlisle, this is the corner of Dickinson, is how you hold up the sunscreen. And in this case, if you ever have a chance, go and look at the corner of the building. You'll see that there's a fin inserted into the corner. And we did that so when you looked at the corner of the building, it made a sharp corner. Without it, the corner looked round from the outside. So there's, a, there's an architectural detail there that creates the, 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 the type of, of you know, drama or the type of knife edge that we want. This is, um, this is at, at Carnegie Mellon. This is a, a, a light uh, vestibule between the older part of the building, between the Michael Dennis part and the newer part. And so we wanted to make a clear distinguishing porthole between those two worlds. Um, again, the sunshade at Dickinson and then a variety of other, other ways of, of sort of detailing different materials. Um, the project that I'm going to show you is one sort of half complete. It was uh, it's a two-story uh, renovation of Bobst Library in uh, New York City for NYU, where my son Mills goes to school. So that's always fun to go down and see him and visit the construction site. We completed the second floor, which is the special collections library spaces. We did not finish the third floor where all of the collections will be stored. And uh, we're negotiating right now to finally go back into that space and finish it. So again, you know, these are long, long projects, 2016 to 2022. The last one I showed you, the, the one for uh, Towson, we started that one in 2013. Um, the, the thing that's interesting about this building is not only the building itself, which is a building designed by Philip Johnson, really his first big public piece of architecture. It has this wonderful atrium in it that another architect has come and added this beautiful screen for safety and protection of the students. But the collection of the materials in this <coughs> special collections library are really wild. It has all of the uh, uh, paraphernalia from the riot girls. It has all kinds of gay uh, literature and, and all kinds of uh, historic books and records. It has records of the 1969 um, protests in New York. It has all of the history of NYU and downtown New York. So there's this sort of gritty collection of, of materials that we were asked to make a reading room for. And we decided that we would use this loft aesthetic, this downtown vibe to guide the vocabulary of the, the spaces that we were gonna do. Um, additionally, you know, in thinking about this being a Philip Johnson building, here's Philip down here in the bottom. He's talking to the president of the university and, and um, a donor um, that the building was named after. We thought that it might be interesting to relate to some of Philip's other projects uh, within, the, within the, the design of these spaces. Philip Johnson, of course, was uh, teamed with Mies van der Rohe to do the Seagram building. He was a great early modernist. He was the first uh, architectural um, curator at MoMA, incredibly knowledgeable about architecture. And he was a great lover of John Stone. In his own house in New Canaan, there was a glass box that's always photographed. Everybody assumes that you know, Philip slept in there. The truth is he slept in the brick building behind it. And this is a picture of Andy Warhol taking a nap in, in Philip Johnson's brick house. And if you notice the top of it, the, the ceiling, there's this sort of floating vault that doesn't touch the walls and, and light is coming down the edges. And that's his take on looking at John Stone's um, uh, breakfast room, this handkerchief vault in, in the Stone space has little clear story windows that lets daylight stream around the edges. And it's one of the most beautiful sort of sculptural spaces that I've ever visited. Um, so keep those, those two images in the back of your mind as we go through this next uh, series of, of images. Another set of ideas that inform this project is the idea of framing the space. In Johnson's building, he, he inverted the idea of a traditional library. And, and we've read the correspondence between him and the president. He was very specific about why he wanted to do it. He felt that NYU did not have its own quad, and that he wanted to make a courtyard in the building that would be the quad for the university. Um, traditionally, this would be where the books are located, and then the reading rooms would be around the outside. He inverted it and put the reading rooms on the edge. The other thing that's interesting in this building is there's a series of trusses in the middles of these floors that support mezzanines in some places. And so we're going to have to deal with these trusses in our new um, design for the renovation. Additionally, we thought that this idea of framing space, framing volumes, 
would be a, a, a metaphor for how we framed the experience of a researcher. So you'll see a set of, of vaults uh, over the researcher space, and I'll explain a little bit more why and how those were done. Um, so this is the sequence. I mean, what we were really interested in was making a, a, a sequence of traditional rooms, well-detailed, well-scaled, um, modern contemporary spaces. It starts with a, a vestibule, and the vestibule is lit from, the, from behind, so it's a glowing vestibule. And we did that because we wanted the people that walked in the front door of the building to look up and see this glowing vestibule and, and understand that there's something special now up on the second floor. We also linked the interior elevations with a new frit pattern in the glass. So you can see these two floors are special within the rest of the stacked floors of the atrium. And then the sequence that you move through from the, from the elevator bank or the stairs at the front would be a series of gallery spaces between the trusses, a series of, of, of rooms where you can uh, store your books, where the, the researchers store their books, uh, you know, change your clothes, whatever you're gonna do before you go into the space. And then lastly, the reading room, which looks out over the south elevation of the building. So the detail of how we did this is that we have flat um, panels of LED lights that are embedded in the wall behind polycarbonate glass. And I don't have the, the edge detail, but the polycarbonate glass is allowed to extend beyond the metal frame that holds it. We couldn't make the floor luminous. We really wanted to do that with glass and we had, we had designed it that way. And it turned out that by chipping out the concrete to do it, we began to uh, hurt the structural integrity of the, of the floor. So we actually just used a white uh, tile. Unfortunately, we also had to use very thick mullions in the outside here. I'm gonna show you all the problems with the space too, because there's a fire code and a fire separation between that space and the big lobby. This, uh, this um, wall has to have a, a two hour rating. But you can see inside where the gallery starts, where the, the lighter series of frames that echo uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe's treatment of glass and steel and Philip Johnson's uh, spaces. So the next thing that I think is unique about this is that we framed the existing trusses in um, glass. And the glass has an acid etched pattern to it. So it's a little bit frosted, you might say. And we lit the inside of the truss with these very low lights down below. And it was important to us that the dimension of the light was no greater than the dimension of the mullion that encases the glass. So, you, so that the, the trusses would just seem to glow, you would be unaware of where the light source was, and that they would become these, um, these sort of frames that you would, that you would you know, experience, and that you would also be able to hang different art objects and different you know, hooks and things. There's a number of, of hooks that are embedded in the ceiling. That you can hang things in front of it. This is before they, they began to put up the show. There are vitrines. There is a receptionist that meets everybody. They sign in. They, uh, they um, you know, have to, it's a very controlled environment. You call ahead to get the certain books you want and they go and get them for you. The other thing that we did in the spaces is that we matched the concentric um, pattern of the light fixtures that you see from Washington Square Park. If you ever walk outside this building at, uh, at dusk and look up, there are a series of north reading rooms. There are two story volumes that, that climb the face of that elevation. And they're really beautiful as you look up at these, at these, at these you know, squares floating in space. And so we did something similar, but our squares are not continuously luminous. You can take out any one of these lights and move it anywhere in this uh, track. So there are down lights, there are wall washers, there are little LED strips. So it's this really super flexible way of being able to light different objects on the wall. So now we've moved into one of the side galleries. Um, in the end of the gallery, there was a, a volume floating. And we did that on purpose so that spatially, you would be aware that there's this connection all the way through the space. This is the front of that volume, which has a, a video projector that can show different things. This is the back of that volume, which is the, the lockers. This is a drawing taken through that. So you can see that there's a series of steel tubes that go all the way up to the concrete, down to the concrete floor. There are glass panes that are inserted in between. And then there's this millwork shell that is also built around a structural frame. So this happens to be the, the seating area right here, which then has a, uh, some storage space for the librarians on the backside. You can see, uh, you can't see it in this space. We'll see it in the next one. 
The next thing that I think is a, a series of interesting uh, detailing uh, questions is how to do these vaults. And so um, you can see on the left, all the different variations we tried out. And, and truth be told, before we got to this, this sort of these white vaults, we tried a lot of other ones. We tried some that were luminous and that was really hard to do. It was really expensive. And then I had the idea of, of, of actually using gold leaf to make these vaults. And the idea was that the, the screen that, that surrounds the, the atrium would be replicated in this beautiful gold leaf. And you know, when they put on gold leaf, they're in little square patches. And I thought it would have a wonderful texture. It would reflect the light. And the librarians thought I was completely nuts. So we, ended, we came back with this idea of making something simpler, and I'm glad we did. Um, what you see are GFR, uh, GFRC, so gla glass reinforced uh, gypsum uh, uh, panels. And they come in, they come in four, four pieces, and then there's an inch and a half of acoustic plaster that we're pressing up into it to make sure that the experience of the researchers is as you know, sort of uh, quiet as possible. The thing that I think was interesting about the design of them was that the, what we really ended up with was a, uh, uh, a handkerchief shape, and then the space between the handkerchief became this longine shape. And what we did then was take that longine shape and put it back in the middle of each one of the handkerchiefs. So there's this even, even rhythm of longines that, that lights down directly onto the uh, tables within a bigger pattern of these vaults. The space was really low. I mean, the, the funny thing about Bob's library was this floor, I think, was, was 11 feet floor to floor, and the floor above was 14 feet floor to floor. And we really wanted to put the, the library up there and put the storage on this floor, but because of phasing and different things, they really wanted us to do it this way. So for us to get the ceiling the way we wanted to do it, we literally just spackled and painted the concrete of the underside of the floor and affixed these vaults to the to the ceiling. It came in four pieces. The vaults are only curved really in one one direction. Um, so there are there are two types. There's a type A and a type B. It's flipped over here, type B and type A. There are lights, there are sprinklers incorporated, in, incorporated into this. And there are also very, very small cameras that are watching the people as they hopefully don't cut up the books and take them home. So there's all kinds of, of other layers of, of systems that are incorporated into these panels. The uh, mechanical ventilation systems run down the edges so that we can make the center space as high as possible. This is the back of that detailed um, floating volume that I showed you, so storage for the librarians and places where they can, uh, you know, uh, they, can, they can have all kinds of different, different things on display in those, those little volumes. All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is this process idea. And um, architects talk a lot about process. And I think we have a lot of faith in the process. You, you, you develop this idea that if you've done it once, you can do it again, even though you have no idea if you can even do it. Maybe that's a, a better way to say it. So the notion of investigate, ask, draw, tell, and build. Um, traditionally, people talk about the design process in, in a way like this, where there's conceptual design, schematic design, design development, construction documents, construction bidding, and construction administration. Super linear, it looks super organized. You know, and, you know, all of these sort of questions are answered at different points along here. It's all worked out. The truth is, you know, I, 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 think, I think of it more this way. And, and I think that the, the reason I think of it this way is that there's a lot of back and forth that informs the design process. And all of that stuff that you were seeing there is really just here. It's in, the, it's in the, the drawing and the telling. But you need to be able to sort of understand the place. You need to ask your clients questions. And then you need to, to investigate it by drawing, spending time to draw. Um, you know, sometimes it actually more, more feels like this. But um, I'm going to take you through a project and try to show you this process uh, as it, as it lay, lay, it's played out. This is a, an interesting project for me because uh, first of all, it's the longest running one. Look, it, the, the project was started in 1983, maybe not by me, but by somebody else. And here we are in 2021 doing something else to it. What it was is a building on the left that was done by Fred Coder and Susie Kim, the, the first place that I worked. And in addition that I did in 1987, 
uh, when I was just out of grad school. So when Fred and Susie received this commission, what they found on the site was a one-story office building for an insurance company. It was called Hastings Tapley. Um, they did some research in, pre in, in, in previous lives. This site once had a church. It had a sort of tripartite church on it. And that led them to think about this building as a tripartite competition, so the middle, the middle nave and, and two aisles. And they came up with this really, really interesting facade. And um, it's on a, a sort of a side street in the middle of East Cambridge. It's not, not, very, not very public, not very visible. But there's a, there's a sort of a questioning quality that I think that you would have if you walked by this building and you would wonder, why does it look like this? So back to Palladio and, and uh, Colin Rowe and Le Corbusier. This building is the true sort of child of an article that Colin Rowe wrote in 1950. It was called Modernism and, excuse me, Mannerism and Modern Architecture. And it, as part of that article, he traced the development of a blank panel that was captured in the second story of Casa di Palladio by Andrea Palladio. He, he wrote a lot about it, and he wrote about how, you know, the, the balustrade continues through it, which is very odd. The fact that the, um, uh, that the panel is blank, that has nothing in it. Um, it turns out when I did more research on it, it turns out this is where a fireplace was and this was a renovation of an existing building. So there was really, really no reason to put a window there. But there's this sort of um, second story porch above a first story porch that's an enigma. And then he began looking at, at Villa Schwab, which is one of Le Corbusier's first buildings. And it's before he really broke with more traditional architecture, before he became the modernist that we all know today. And this Villa Schwab has a similar enigmatic panel in the front. You know, it has a, it has a funny little round window here. It's, it's held up by two little pencil-like columns and little oval windows. It's a very strange thing. It ends up that this is actually the location of a bunch of stairs running up and down. That's what he's using it for. And so Colin Rowe, you know, is, is saying that, that, that Le Corbusier knew about Palladio, and he obviously did. And he's using references from his history to inform his contemporary architecture, just in the same way that Fred and Susie did. So these were two drawings that were done by Kent Knight when that building was uh, first being designed, the first phase of, Hast of Hastings Tapley. And if you look closely down in the bottom, there's a picture of Le Corbusier down here talking to the two owners of the building. And I love that. And the drawings are beautiful because they're showing that behind that very flat facade with this big panel, there's all kinds of spatial complexity. There is a, a, a desk or a, a dresser in the edge of the conference room that has the window down below that's letting light into it. Um, there is a clear story window at the top that's letting light into that one. There is all kinds of um, uh, relationships between this, this oval space at the, at the front door and the curving of the, of the window and the curve of the vault. Um, and so that building was built. It got a lot of, of, of coverage. It sort of put Fred and Susie, and here they are down here on the map. And in 1987, the client came back and said, you know, we'd really like to make an addition. We bought the building on the, on the right. We want to tear that down and we want to add uh, three more stories. Um, you know, we don't need to add a stair or anything like that. It's really all set up just to be an annex onto the, onto the building. And Fred and Susie were, at that point were really busy and they didn't really know what to do with it. And so they had an inner office competition and so for four hours on a Friday afternoon, they put out a couple six packs of beer and everybody worked. And then we hung up our drawings in the conference room in the back. And um, I won't show you what the other folks did. I'll just say that, you know, I was really lucky that, that they picked mine. And my idea was to take a, a facade that I was really in love with at that time, a building by, uh, by Giuseppe Tirani. And this is an apartment building in, in Italy. And he had done this sort of raking facade where parts of balconies and parts of windows overlapped. And you know, while it has a sort of a strong center, there are these, there are these pieces that rake away from it and makes another center. So it's a, it's a much more complex system of centers and, 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 and off centers and relationships in that way. And so I thought, couldn't we take this facade and rake it across? I, I told Fred that nobody ever saw his big his big square uh, panel frontally because it was on a, a side street and then everybody saw it obliquely in a car 
and then we were going to make this like a speedy facade, like a blurring, like you might see out of the corner of your eye. And to do it, it was a it was a collage. It was done on a Xerox machine. It was done with colored pencil. It was done very quickly. Um, one of my friends recently, we were we were talking to him about getting the drawings to renovate this building. I'll get to that. But he he accused me of just taking the the building and just smearing it on the on the Xerox machine, to make the drawing, and felt that I had cheated. But no, I did I did make a drawing. So anyway, so once uh, the the project was 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 mine. Um, now we're now we're down to the layer of drawing. And so to go from this, which is really a complete you know cartoon, there's really not much, I don't know, you you could you could probably interpret it a lot of different ways. It went to this drawing. And in this one, there's clearly an idea about making a glass version of the blank panel and then still taking these smaller uh, paned windows and raking them across the facade. In here, there's a ramp that takes you up because there was a number of steps on the side. So we were gonna add a handicap ramp to get into the building. And then there's an end, a, a, a distinct end bay at the end. Um, there's also this sort of zone where the parts that are raking across make another center. So there's a, there's a series of sliding centers and a, then a, a reestablishment of the, of, the, of the other bay at the end of the building. So that's the first pencil sketch. This is what actually got built. This is me in my younger days where I was just crazy enough to actually draw every brick, but I actually thought that I needed to do it to understand it. Um, as part of the, the development of the building, they, they decided they didn't want to spend as much money on the glass. And we filled in certain parts of it with a darker brick. The glass, because it's a long, thin window, and the, the windows that were used in the original building were hopes windows, which is what Frank Lloyd Wright used. They're, so they're steel windows. They're steel industrial dash windows. They're not thermally broken. They're uh, real old school ways of making windows. When Hope's windows get to have longer ex ex uh, spans, they bolt on the inside little steel angles to support it so it, doesn't, so it doesn't flex. And I took those steel angles and I bolted them on the outside of the glass, and then I bolted them into the brick so you could still think that maybe that window was there. Um, this area of, of, of East Cambridge was pretty dangerous, and so this side had to get a gate on it. We've got a series of sort of French balconies, um, but you can see pretty much what it looked like. And that, that's a drawing that I did for Fred to talk about that building, um, uh, you know, being a blur. So again, exploring it through drawing. Uh, really, the ideas are coming out through the act of drawing. So now we move to the middle of the pandemic, 2020, and I get a call from the current owners of this building. And they're really sweet, sweet guy. He's talking about it. And he, I'd spoken about this in, in, a, in a little piece I'd written a long, long time ago, and he'd found it on the internet. And he called me up and he said, you know, John, um, we're actually planning to renovate the building. We're, um, we've bought it. The, the real estate folks that come into it keep telling us there's not enough glass in the building. And the reason there wasn't enough glass is the neighborhood was super dangerous. In fact, the back of the building was all glass block and, and, and you know, security gates and things like that. And he said, well, we really need to open it up. Uh, we've hired an architect. And would you mind if I just show it to you? And so he sent me these drawings and we talked about it. And I was really, you know, very secretly upset because they were going to take out this beautiful flat panel and they were going to put in these three balls. I'm not quite sure what these circles were. To me, it's like the international sign of, um, um, you know, what, what is it where you go and you hock your, uh, hock your uh, watch or something? Um, and I said, you know, I think I could probably help you. I think I could probably, you know, figure out a better way to do this. I, I think the ideas are, are, are really great, but, you know, I really would like to help you with this. And they said, well, we need to turn it in tomorrow to the, to the uh, architectural review board. It's, it, it, it's just the first submission. We'll be allowed to change it, but we're going to do that. And so they thought about it a while and then they called me up. No, we'd like to, we'd like to see what you can do. And so, you know, I did a little sketch for them talking about how it might change. And, but I didn't really tell them how I was going to do it. I just said, there, there's some ways we could do it. And so um, I reached out to a friend of mine named Jeff Klug. Um, his wife is Pam Butts. They, she was my dearest friend in college. He went to both college and grad school with me. So these are people I've known forever. And they have a wonderful office in Boston. And I said, uh, you know, would you like to help me with this? Uh, Jeff had also worked for Fred, so knew and loved Fred very well. Uh, at this point, Fred had passed away. I should have added. And so 
Together, we worked out this scheme where we were going to replace the, the, the panel, which is made out of synthetic stucco on, on block backup. We were going to replace it with a fritted glass window. So a frit is a type of ceramic paint that is on the inner layer of the glass. And we told them that we could get a yellow frit, and then we would, we would float that fritted window in two little panels of glass. We would carve a new window into the lobby to let in more light. And, you know, and they said, OK. And so here is, this is, these are Jeff's drawings showing what the original uh, scenario was in, in 2021. So you can see the addition and the first phase. And then this is what Jeff and I came up with. So we're adding more glass into the second story here, which is great because it begins, it begins to make this look more like a square. I'll go back and forth. Oops, sorry. He's, he's adding more windows on the left. I love this. He's, he's even changing the doors. See the front doors of the building where he's, he's using smaller styles, thinner styles to let more light into the lobby. And then, I mean, if I'd had my druthers, I probably wouldn't have added quite so much glass onto the lower floor. I think it makes the building feel a little bottom heavy, but you'll see in the final photographs what it looks like. Okay. So here it is under construction last month. You can see the window's not quite done. There's some black trim that goes around the edges and there's some some pieces in here that make this look more um, monolithic. But you can see the, the glass really does look like the big, um, the big panel of, 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 of um, stucco that was there. And you can see that over in here, it's largely the way it was before. So to me, it's this really pretty successful um, a scheme. So it's almost done. I want to back up one more thing and show you one more thing. So if you see up on the top of the original building, there's this eagle. And around the office, we always called it the Screaming Eagle. The truth is, it wasn't really there. It was made for the photographs of the original building. You can see it here. It was made out of wood. The client didn't like it. The client took it off. The client also took off these two columns. Um, and it went away. And so when we came back to renovate the building, we said, you know, you should really put the Screaming Eagle back on. Because we had always loved it. It, it was a takeoff on the, the logo for the insurance company. So it, you know, it had a basis in their in their um, their their graphics, and so there it is without it. And so what I want to show you now are Jeff and Maya's attempt to sort of revise it. So we didn't have the original drawings. I, I sat down and did this drawing based on you know looking at some photographs, and Jeff looked at it, and he said, you know, it looks a little soft, John. I think we could make it a little bit more angry. If it's going to be a screaming eagle. It should look angry. So here's my soft eagle. And here's Jeff's more regal, more on guard, more fitting, probably, eagle. And that's it. That's where I wanted to end with you. So uh, I hope you, uh, you, know, you enjoyed it. I, I, I think that the, the thing that I've really loved about being an architect is the, the thing about the ideas being the generator of, of the buildings that we do. And I hope I gave you some insight into the mind of, of the designer and how we think about these things. And hopefully when you guys are visiting some buildings, you'll, you'll look at them slightly differently now and think about some of these things that we've spoken about today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was very fascinating. And now I do also want to take a stroll around Carlisle too and look at some building corners. Um, I think you brought up a lot of great things for us as a historical society too, especially the NYU building. Um, I think my coworkers and I will probably be thinking about that one. Um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. It doesn't look like any questions or anything have come through. I don't know if you want to give anybody a minute or- Yeah, well, maybe one. I, I mean, <laughs> most of these people that are on the on the, on the the you know, the Zoom here are my friends. So if you guys want to, you know, tell me those things look really bad, that's fine too. John, what were you thinking about? I'm game. Anyway. They put the eagle back. Is that, that's the question. Did, did it go back up Yeah, yet? so uh, it's being fabricated right now. Um, and I, I really, to me, it's sort of the, the fitting end to the whole project because, you know, it was, it was a whimsical thing that was added to the building. And it's those little things that I love. You know, you walk around cities and you find little gargoyles on, on historic buildings. And, you know, there are, there are places I know in Yale, literally, that the architect of the central library at Yale is the gargoyle you see when you walk in the front door. 
So I love things like that. I love those little stories. And it looks like there is one more. Uh, you talked about a two hour separation required in one of the buildings. Uh, I missed how you accomplished that. Would you please repeat it? So the, the, the central void of the Bobst Library is I think it's about an 11 or 12 story atrium. And in the case of a fire, you know, it's a, it's a chimney. All of the smoke is going up and down. And what you want to make sure you do is that you have means of egress, paths of, of, of retreat that the, that the people in the building can get out without being in this, this, this chimney. And so those glass doors on the outside of the, of the library, the, the second floor library, are designed to withstand two hours of flames. And that's, I was, I was complaining that the, the frames around those doors and the frames around those windows are super thick and the glass is super thick. And I wanted to make it light and delicate like the rest of the vocabulary of the, of the, um, the spaces in the, in the special collections library. So there are, there are types of glass, there are sprinkler systems, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. But in the case of this, we did it with the, the system of enclosure, the glass doors and the glass wall. And who was the door manufacturer? I don't know if that was. Oh my that gosh! <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know that. That's a that's a tough one. I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, and we do have one from Facebook too. Uh, how do you navigate navigate reworking a building when form took precedent over function in the original design? When form took precedent over function, which building do you think they're talking about? Ah, uh, let's see. Doesn't say it might just be in general if that ever comes up. I mean, I mean, it's an interesting question. I never really get that opportunity to work on something where form took precedent over function because it seems like so much of the things that we do are, are being generated out of the program. I mean, I'm talking about today, I was talking about sets of ideas that organize specific pieces of program, be it a, a sequence of section, be it the grids of the of the structural grid or the spatial grids, but they're all organizing program. That, are, that is in very specific locations determined by function. So adjacencies of, of lockers to, to gym, changing areas for the people in the black box theater. It's all, it's all sort of, um, that's the first part of the design. Um, I, I never get, get a chance to work on the buildings where the form is primary. Like I think of muse maybe museums or maybe sculptural things like churches or there could be some spaces like that where the form becomes so primary that the that you don't have to worry so much about it but um that wasn't a very good answer but i'd love to i'd love to do something that's just form you know um we'll anyway. do maybe one last one um how sure. does interior design complement your building design so that's a great question um i think they're intrinsically linked i think if you're if you're if you're doing this thing well, this, this idea of architecture, whatever you're, you're doing to create the architectural enclosure on the outside, whatever sort of lens you're seeing that vocabulary through should be the same way that you're treating the interior spaces. And I think that the, the most successful buildings I've worked on do that. I think that um, the one I showed you for Carnegie Mellon, that addition is very specific about the, the dimensions of the, of the mullions, the dimensions of the piers inside, and the dimensions of the frames that, that link between the columns. So I think that there is a, there should absolutely be a link in the, these ideas. And I think the places where it's, where it's problematic is where they don't come together. I think the project that I showed you where it's maybe less, less together would probably be the Towson project where the outside of the building is much more relating to the traditional architecture on the campus. And they, they specifically said they were not interested in the, the more contemporary facades that I showed them during the design process. So that one's a little further apart, the outside and the inside, but almost everything else that I think that I've worked on, I think Dickinson is a really great example. You know, the, the vocabulary on the outside as you move to the inside, I mean, bits and pieces of it turn inside, specifically that it, it, the outside of the building becomes the inside of the building and parts of the lobby. So um, um, if you look, if you, here's another little, another little clue at Dickinson. If you look at the wood paneling detail of the volume where the little cafe is, where the little, counter is, you'll see that there is a gap between the wood panels and there's two little lines. If you go outside the building and you look at the mullion, mullions between the windows, 
The Kamalian of the window is a C-shaped cap, vertically extruded. It's the same proportion. So there are proportions and, and, and detailing that is moving from the outside to the inside that you don't, really, you don't necessarily see, but part of your mind knows it's there and it makes it all work as a, as a complete and total whole. So. There are a couple more that came in. Do you want to do a couple more yeah, as you're sure. talking? You're popping them up. Um, so an interesting one. At what point does the cost, uh, the issue of cost come into play? I can't imagine that is the first point of discussion in designing a building, but it must occur fairly early in the discussion. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question, too. So, you know, in everything we do, we have a budget. I've never had an unlimited budget. And um, what we traditionally do is we do a schematic design package, like that linear uh, process I showed you, and we'll price something then. And it's going to be a very general. It's not going to be very specific. We'll do the same thing at DD. And then when we get through the construction documents, people are bidding on it. Um, because of today's climate with the pandemic and with the supply chain disruptions and with the problems of having, um, you know, just, just general issues of, of finding people to build things today because of everybody's, you know, um, it's hard to find folks to put things together. We've had a lot of problems with our recent projects. Um, the things that we, we put aside right, right in the middle of the pandemic and have brought back and are now getting ready to build, the steel costs 25% more. The aluminum costs 15% more. You can't find the stone that you specified that was supposed to come from Germany that was really nice. And so, you know, we're, we're faced with cost all the time. I'm lucky that at Canon Design, we have our own internal cost estimating group. Traditionally, there will be a GM on a project that, uh, that, will, that will be costing it, costing it themselves. We'll do it ourselves inside our, our company, and then we'll bring the two together to reconcile them and make sure that we're, we're getting the best bang for our buck for our client. But it's a, it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. And I'm sure, especially now, it's probably even more difficult. I think that's what everybody's talking about. Um, one more had come in, and you were talking a little bit about lines earlier in your presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the use of horizontal versus vertical lines in your design? Is it dependent upon the location? No, that's a good question. You're right. I, I really did talk about it in terms of planner extrusions, because the plan is the sort of the mother of the of the of the idea. But there are there were horizontal datums in the in that Carnegie Mellon project that I definitely could have shown, and maybe that maybe that's a good thing to add to it. Um, you know, traditionally the sort of the horizontal datums are determined by the floor to floor heights. And so in the case of that building, we're matching the floor to floor height. So there are gonna be lines that are running around the building. So that's just sort of accidental. But um, when I showed you the, the last image for Carnegie Mellon, which was an unwrapped elevation, you could see there was a series of horizontal lines that linked up across it, even though parts of it was going up and down. There's always a, there, there is always a datum. I mean, traditionally in architecture, there were, cornice lines and, and lines of, of trim. You know, I'm sitting in a little, a little office here where there's a, there's a rail at the at, at mid-level of the wall for your chair to hit. So there were reasons for sort of architectural lines and in interiors, just as there's reasons for architectural lines in the outside to stop a drip. You know, when you look at the top of a wall and the, the coping at the top extends out beyond the face of the wall and makes a little shadow, that's so that the drip from the top of it doesn't drip down the face of the wall. So th these sort of lines and shadow and a demarcation horizontally are sometimes made for really, really good functional reasons like the two I described. And other times, you know, you're trying to tie together. Um, I, mean, I, think that the, I think that the last building I showed you, the, the Hastings Tafley one, where all of the windows are raking across, that one's maybe a better version of um, the horizontal extrusion of things to tie, tie things together. Literally, we call it rubber bands, like literally just pulling rubber bands across a building's face. Great, great. It looks like that might be the last one, but thank you again for coming out to speak yes. with us and for everybody for attending. We had about 14 people on here and another 10 on Facebook. Um, and this will be, if anybody is interested in seeing it, we'll make sure it's up on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. So if there's any questions about what was talked about, it'll be up soon. It'll also be up on Facebook. But uh, thank you again, John, for joining us tonight and giving us a really nice lecture. It was a pleasure. Thank Good night, you. Everybody. Good night.